So we left off on vectors. We just did some magnitudes. And we're going to look at some vector algebraic properties of vector operations. So we're going to take vectors are going to be u, v, and w. And they'll be in r, n, and dimensional vectors. We're going to have scalars. And we're going to use Greek letters for our scalars, alpha and beta. And they, they will come from r. So our first property, u plus v equals v plus u. What property do we call this? So it's almost associativity, commutativity. So you can add vectors either order, commute them. We also get associativity, which I'll write that. So almost every operation we do is binary, meaning it takes two inputs and gives you one output. Addition is no different, but because it doesn't matter which order you add, you can go u plus v first and then add w, or you could go v plus w and then add u. Because of this, you actually don't need to write parentheses because it doesn't matter which ones you add first. So we kind of pretend that addition is a operand that takes more than two uh, inputs because you can add three things, no problem. So here we have scalar multiplication. Now there are two different types of zeros here. On the left side, we have the number zero. On the right side, I have the vector zero. So number, a scalar times a vector is always gonna give you a vector. In this case, the zero number times any vector is gonna give you the zero vector. So that's why we write the zero in bold on the right side. And we have associativity of scalar multiplication where we can reassociate our scalars. If we add the scalars together and then multiply, that's the same as multiplying our scalars and then adding the two vectors. So we will call this the distributive property. Every vector has a negative version. And if you add the two vectors together, the vector plus its negative, also known as the additive inverse, you get the zero vector out. So it'll have all the same coordinates, just opposite signs. So they add up to zero. The number one times u is just u. That won't change the vector at all, scaling it by one. And there is a second way to distribute. If you take a scalar times the sum of two vectors, that's equal to alpha u plus alpha v. So two ways you can distribute. They look identical. They're just the role of the scalars and vector switches. These are all of our algebraic properties here. So our next definition is going to be unit vector. So unit, of course, that refers to one. So what property of vector do we mean when we say unit? That doesn't refer to any single coordinate. It refers to the magnitude or the length. So it can point any direction, including down any of the axes, positive or negative. But if the magnitude is one, it's a unit vector. So it's a vector with magnitude equals one. So we have parallel vectors. V and W are parallel.
exactly when v equals alpha w and alpha is not equal to zero. It's if you have two vectors that are parallel and your scalar is zero, that means one of your vectors is the zero vector and it doesn't really make sense to say they're parallel. But as long as your vectors are not both zero, your alpha can't be zero for them to be equal like this. So we could write that more compactly. This double vertical bar means parallel. So V is parallel to W exactly when. That's the double arrow. Exactly when V equals alpha W. So I'm going to do a tiny bit of algebra. So I could, alpha is not zero, so I could rewrite it, multiply by one over alpha. You can move your scalar to the other side. So for example, if alpha is two, that means V and W, uh, V is twice as long as W if alpha is two. And of course you can move the two to the other side as a half. So there's no reason alpha goes on one side in particular. As long as it's not zero, you can move the scalar on the other side, super easy. So now what we're going to do is find a unit vector in the direction of another vector. And let's get a little more specific with parallel. I'm going to take alpha instead of just not zero, alpha to be greater than zero. And then we'll call two vectors with a negative scalar, we'll call those anti-parallel. So they'll be pointing opposite directions. So parallel, they're pointing the same way, and then anti, parallel. So that's two vectors pointing opposite directions, and that's when V equals alpha W, where alpha is less than zero. So they're negative multiples of each other. And of course, if alpha is negative, one over alpha also negative. So that's anti-parallel. So we're going to start with the vector v that's not the zero vector. And I want to find a unit vector parallel to v. So I'm going to let u be the unit vector. What does it mean for u to be parallel to v? So exactly when there is an alpha greater than zero, such that So I can write it as u equals alpha v, or I can write it as alpha u equals v. I can put the alpha on either side. I'm just going to arbitrarily put it on this side here. Now what I want to do is find alpha. So without knowing v, it's kind of hard to find alpha. But there is one nice property of the vector u. What property does u, the vector u, have? Magnitude is 1. So let's take the magnitude of both sides of this equation. So the left side we just have magnitude u, which is 1. The right side, I'm going to distribute that magnitude across the product. So we have absolute value of alpha times the magnitude of V. And we assumed alpha was positive. So absolute value of alpha is just regular alpha because alpha is going to be positive. And I want to solve for alpha. So divide by magnitude V. And that's alpha right there. So what that means is we want to get a unit vector in the same direction. All we're going to do is take the vector and divide by its magnitude. 
that will give us a unit vector in the right direction. So u is alpha v, which is 1 over magnitude v, that's alpha times v, and we'll write it as v over magnitude v. So that'll be how we turn a vector into a unit vector. Now at the top I wrote vector v better not be the zero vector. What problem would I run into with this last formula if vector v was a zero vector? I uh, would get divide by zero undefined because the magnitude would be zero of that zero vector. So it doesn't make sense to have a direction if you have a zero vector. So let's go ahead and find a unit vector or find the unit vector. Parallel two. Now you're also going to see the the words parallel to. Oops. I don't know why it turned the le green. All right, parallel to. Uh, you're going to see that written sometimes as uh, in the same direction. So that just means parallel. And the vector word going to be parallel to two, uh, negative 2 to negative 1. So that vector is v. So find the vector u. So when you're finding magnitudes, I did not even bother writing negative 2 squared or negative 1 squared. I just wrote regular 2 squared. Why is that okay? <coughs> so you're going to square that negative out, it's going to be positive. What you shouldn't do and what I don't want to do here, the reason I skip writing the negative, because what I don't want to do is have negative 4 plus 4 minus 1. If I don't square the negative correctly, I don't want to carry that negative through. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. All right, we're dividing by 3. That's the same as multiplying by a third. And we can distribute it inside that vector. Negative 2 thirds, positive 2 thirds, negative 1 third. Any of those are completely okay. They're all the same, just written slightly different ways. So they're all correct. So the next topic is midpoint. So let's take midpoint between two points, P1, X1, Y1, Z1, and P2, X2, Y2, Z2. So the midpoint will be halfway between that and down that line segment, we'll use M for the midpoint. How did we get midpoint before? So back in the good old days when we had two dimensions, we formed a triangle like this, and we looked at the x1, x2 coordinate, and 
what I wanted to do is get halfway between x1 and x2. How do we get the number halfway between? So we are going to divide by 2, but what do we have to do first? Well, so we're going to be careful. If we subtract, we'll get the distance across. I could use half the distance added to x1, but that's a long way to go. How do I get the number between two other numbers? Average them. Add them together, divide by 2. That's the easy way to do this. So I could get the distance, cut it in half, add that half distance to x1, but that's a lot of work. So we're going to do average the two together. That gives us the halfway point between any two numbers. Positive, negative, doesn't matter. That'll give me the halfway point. We have to do that for every coordinate, the x, the y, and the z. So our midpoint m will equal x1 plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2, and z1 plus z2 over 2. You could write it as p1 plus p2 over 2 if that works better by writing it as adding two points together and then multiplying that by the number one half or dividing by two. So whichever of those works better for you, put that on your cheat sheet. So a lot of these are too simple to do example problems on. So I'm just skipping over the example problems. So now we're going to do a couple word problems. So jet is flying east at 500 miles per hour airspeed. And the wind it's flying in is blowing 60 degrees north of east. And 70 miles an hour. So find the ground speed. All right, so let's think about uh, how to draw this out. So we're going to have a jet flying east at 500 miles per hour. So east is to the right, so we're going 500 miles an hour to the east. So the wind is blowing 60 degrees north of east. So east would be directly to the right, 60 degrees north of that would be right there. So it's going to be 60 degrees northward of east. And that magnitude is 75. Seventy. So if we look at this intuitively, overall, this is the airspeed's 500, so what I have to do is combine these together. So we're going to add them. The way I showed you how to add is in rectangular coordinates. You're going to add the x components and add the y components. We don't have rectangular coordinates right now. We really have polar coordinates. So we're going to have to do a switch into rectangulars. So we'll give these vectors names. I'll go v, j for jet and vector A for airspeed, or vector A for air. 
So the jet vector is much easier. What's the x component of the jet vector? 500. So that's how much we're going to the right. And how much going is going in the y or the up direction? Zero. Zero. So that one was pretty easy. Now we're going to go for the VA vector. This one has a little bit to the right and a little bit up. But we have to carefully decide how much to the right, how much up. So we're given this in polar coordinates. So I'm going to use cosine theta, sine theta. That gives me the x and y component if I'm using the angle theta. And then this will give me the unit vector in that direction. And now all I have to do is scale it by 70. So it has to be 70 times bigger. So I'll write that as magnitude VA. So what I know is the angle of this vector and the magnitude of the vector. So magnitude is 70. The angle is 60 degrees. Now you want to be careful. This angle was measured the proper way we measure angles from the positive x-axis. If I was 60 degrees west of south, so for example, if it was 60 degrees west of south, so here's south, so if I went 60 degrees west of south, I would be right there. And that is not the way we'd measure that angle normally. So if this was our angle, you'd have to come back and figure out what are we actually measuring right there? Or you could just go back through your trig and think about what coordinates would that point have using reference angles and negatives. So luckily we had a nice easy angle in quadrant one. So we didn't have to worry about all this. It could be half green, that's fine. All right, so we just have 60. So cos 60 is 1 half, sine 60 squared 3 over 2, distribute that 70. We'll have 35 and 35 square root 3. So to get the total speed, so air speed, or ground speed equals air speed plus the speed of the air. I want to write airspeed plus airspeed, but I mean two different things. Wind we'll go wind speed. That seems like the same thing, but airspeed means the speed of the aircraft in the air. So our airspeed VJ plus VA. So we get 535 comma 35 square root 3. So this would be the ground speed. Well, technically all these are velocities, even though the problem is written with speed everywhere. What if I want to know the miles per hour, the actual ground speed? Take the magnitude. So this is really the ground velocity. And speed is the magnitude of velocity. So ground speed will be the square root of 535 squared plus 
35 squared times 3. Now I shortcutted that last one right there. I'm squaring 35 and squaring square root 3, so it just turns to 35 squared plus 3. So I'm not going to bother squaring 535, so your calculator can get this. So our last problem, we're going to suspend a weight from the ceiling. So we'll take a 75 Newton disco ball. It is suspended by two wires. One wire makes a 45 degree angle with the ceiling. Uh, the other makes 30 degree angle with the ceiling. So I want to find the magnitude of the forces in both wires. What is the magnitude of a force in a wire also called? That's called tension. So let's draw the picture of what we're working with here. So a ceiling, we'll just draw as a flat line right here. So the disco ball, I'll draw as a ball with a little point on top where we'll tie the wires into. Now one wire is 30 degrees at the ceiling, one is 45. Let's do the 45 degree first. So I'm going to draw that coming down. Now the 30 degree angle, uh, look at this, 45 degrees, I'll make it perfect. All right, 45, now 30. All right, so those are our angles right there. I want to be very careful where I put the measurements. Now I did make a choice as to which side was 30 and which was 45, but the tension in the wires won't change if I flip them around. The X components will go the other directions, but the tension will still be the same. Now most of you are going to be engineers, What's the danger of hanging a weight from the ceiling with two wires? Could swing side to side. What happens if one wire breaks? You've created a wrecking ball. So you may want to do three or four wires depending on what's below it. If it's just held up and nobody's underneath it, it probably doesn't matter. But usually you're probably not going to hang a disco ball in a room that will be empty indefinitely. All right, we're not worried about that. All right, we're going to find the tension. It would be a much more complicated problem if I put four wires up with different angles. That would be a lot uh, more going on. All right, so first of all, is the, should the disco ball be moving? Left, right, forward or backward, up or down? Nope, it should be stationary. So we call this static equilibrium. So that's the situation we're trying to create.
What does static equilibrium mean about the forces? Sum of the forces equals zero for the sum of the forces, you add all the forces and you better get zero. If you don't get zero, something's moving or you did your computation wrong. Well, if both of these forces are pulling in the upwards direction, why is the disco ball, how can the disco ball be not moving? So what's the extra force? The weight or gravity pulling down. So there's a third force. I'm gonna go green for my forces here. So we're gonna have one force going up each wire here. <laughs> Is green not the color to use? No, you're supposed to use red. But. Oh, I'll use red. If I can erase them. It's fine. Maybe I won't be erasing them. Maybe they'll only draw on top. It's not very red. <laughs> oh, that's what I was expecting to happen. All right, so we got red, red, red right there. All right, so all these forces need to add up to be zero. So another way to think about it, if you break the Y, just think about the Y coordinates, the upward force of the two on the two ropes needs to equal gravity. And the sideways force on each rope cancels the sideways force on the other rope. So that's what's going to be happening here. So let's give these names. I'll call it V1, V2 for the first ve vector, second vector, and then VG for gravity. Let's do the gravity first. So our units were newtons, and it was a 75 newton disco ball. So it should be zero, negative 75. All right, we'll do vector one now. All right, so vector one, we're gonna have to describe in polar coordinates and I don't know the magnitude. So it's going to be just magnitude vector one. Why would it be incorrect to use 45 degrees for my angle? Well, I can use degrees here, but is that? So I need to measure in the standard way, which would be from the positive x-axis. Trying to unselect. <laughs> All right, well, I don't really need that guy anyways over there. All right, so I need to measure that way. What angle would we have if I measured like that? So I could do 180 minus 45 or 90 plus 45, a few different ways to think about it. But it's the, I think of it as three quarters of the way to 180. That's another way to think about it. So that's gonna be 135. So that's our angle here. So that's vector one and vector two. Oh wait, what am I doing? No, that's correct. Yeah, because I want my x to be negative. Okay, yeah, that's correct. All right, vector two. The proper way to measure vector two would be this angle right here, and that is 30 degrees. So that's the something about corresponding interior angles are the same. So that's our 30 degree angle right there. So 
So we know cosine and sine values here. So cos 135 degrees, negative one over square root two. Sine 135 degrees, one over square root two. After 30 degrees, cos 30 is square root three over two and sine is one over two. All right, static equilibrium. We need to add up all of our vectors and get the zero vector. So there's our three vectors, Vg plus V1 plus V2 equals zero. And I'm going to distribute our magnitudes inside these vectors. So we'll line everything up, VG, 0, negative 75, plus vector 1, plus vector 2, So this is supposed to be the vector zero, zero. That's the zero vector. So now I'm gonna add up all the X components and then add up all the Y components. So the X components, we get negative magnitude V1 over square root two plus magnitude V2 square root three over two. And our Y components, negative 75 plus V1 over square root two, plus V2 over two, still equals zero, zero. So what we are looking at is really two equations. There's an X equation and a Y equation. So the X equation happens in the first coordinate, and then the Y equation, which I'll underline twice, happens in the second coordinate. So we're just comparing X's and Y's they all need to be equal. So our x equation is zero equals negative v1 over square root two plus magnitude v2 square root three over two. Our y equation is zero equals negative 75 plus v1 over square root two plus v2 over two. So what are we looking at right now in this situation? So we got two equations. How many unknowns do we have? Two. two. So that's perfect. Two equations, two unknowns. You should be able to solve for V1 magnitude and V2 magnitude. These are actually linear equations. Nothing squared, no square roots. The constants have square roots, but the variables themselves are uh, all to the first power. So I'm gonna leave this problem here and not finish it all the way, but you're gonna find V1 and V2. That'll be the tensions right there.